Okay, good evening, Rabotai. Today I want to discuss with you some things about the parasha, parasha of Dechlecha, which really relates to our lives as individuals. And then I want to take it a little bit, speak about Hamu Badiyal Vashalom, since we just had his Yortzai, his, um, his um, sixth Yortzai passing. And um, I believe all of us really we have been affected, either directly or indirectly, with uh, the breadth of knowledge and the students that he had, the movement that he made in the world. Even here in Chutzlar, we have been seriously affected uh, by him, among other perhaps two, three million other people um, worldwide. So therefore, it's Kedai to dedicate some talk in his Ilui Neshama, in his memory. You know, this week we are introduced to Avraham Avinu, basically, right? We start with Avraham, our nation starts with Avraham, right? Eloke Avraham, Eloke Yitzchak, Eloke Yaakov. And surprisingly, it all ends with Avraham as well. When we finish the bracha of Avot, every day, three times a day, we say Shemona Yisrael. And the structure of Shemona Yisrael is, it starts with the name of Avraham Avinu, right? <coughs> and the bracha of Avot finishes with what? Baruch Atah Hashem. Magen. Magen Abraham. Not Magen Yaakov, which I would have probably done Magen Yaakov, because he's the father of the, the 12 tribes, the 12 Shvatim. He's the, the Jewish father, so to speak. And not only that, Chachamim tell us that Yaakov Avinu was Bechir Sheba Avot. He was the greatest of the Avot. So he clearly do not end with the best, we end with Abraham. Why? Good question, right? If that's not bad enough, think about um, what perhaps all of you have heard, that Abraham Amir was the first one that when believed in God. In Hashem, right? In one God. Right? right. Wrong. He was not the first one that believed in God. Uh, in his time, there were two yeshivot. Mm -hmm. Forget about people who believed in God. They had yeshivot in his time. They had yeshiva of Shem, the yeshiva of Ever. He sent his children there to learn. So many, many people before him that they believed in God. So he was clearly not the first one who believed in Hashem. He was alumni of Sishiv. And he was not, he also was not the greatest person in his own generation. The Khatam Sofer, Rabbi Moshe Sofer writes, he has a beautiful hakdama preface to the second volume of his responses, his, his teshuvot, Yoredeah. The beginning is called, it's like a contrast, it's like a booklet by itself called Pituche Chotam. So in the beginning of Pituche Chotam, he writes, he says, Shem and Ever were bigger Nevi'im than Avraham Avinu. They were bigger in their level of spirituality, they were higher than Avraham. He says, I'll prove it to you, because when Avraham Avinu's daughter-in-law is pregnant, Rivka is pregnant, and she doesn't know what's going on with her. She doesn't know that she's bearing twins, mm -hmm. and they are going to be um, diametrically opposed spiritually. So she is extremely confused, because she's passing by Beit HaMidrash every time she sits and learns Torah or does a mitzvah, mm -hmm. one of them starts getting excited. And whenever she passes by a church, the other one also gets excited. She says, what is this kid, a confused guy? So goes by, She goes to ask a shayla. So who do you go to? Who do you go to? If, the, if your father is the biggest Tamil Hakam, or your father-in-law is the biggest of a go to him. Right? A humorous story, actually. You know, Rav Shlomo Zalman Orbach and Rav Yosef Shalom El Yashiv, they were the two biggest halakhic arbiters of the past generation. These were the two biggest poskim, halakhic authorities. And they married into each other, their families. 
Rav Shlomo Zalman Orbach's son, Rav Azviel Shlita, married Rav Yashiv's daughter. Okay? So this daughter is going with one of his, uh, her friends to buy glasses. Right? She needs new glasses. So she goes, and there is a Avrech Kolel, there is a young uh, Torah scholar, a young Torah student that's, uh, you know, the seller. He's the salesman of the store, standing there. And she's talking out loud with her friend. She said, he said, you know, there's this, this photochromic glasses that you go in the sun, it turns, it turns dark. So it's machloket, if on Shabbat you could, you could have this because you color, so to speak, you're coloring it. But the interesting thing is that her father and her father-in-law <coughs> were the two big people who disagreed about this. So she's speaking out loud with her friend. She says, my father holds is Asur. My father-in-law holds is Mutar. What do I do? <laughs> and this guy is listening to them speaking. He says, you couldn't control him. So he says, you ask your father, you ask your father, go ask your Posek. Go ask your Rav. I didn't know who she is. He didn't know the father-in-law. So this is the same thing. But he got the question. Who do you go to? Do you go to, to your father, or father-in-law, or do you go to a stranger? Of course you have to go to your father. But she didn't. She went to the Yeshiva Shem Ever. So says the Khadam Sofer, you know why? Because they were bigger. They were bigger than the Hachamim. They were bigger Nevi'im than Abraham Avim. So now the question is even, even bigger. Why Abraham? What's so special about Abraham? Right? And this question really, as obvious as it is, was asked by Maran Bet Yosef. Maran asks the question. Maran says, why is it that Abraham Avinu was chosen when there were bigger people than him? Why? And he writes the obvious answer, which is so obvious that we don't think about it. He says, you know why? Because Shem and Ever, they were more than happy to teach Torah to whomever came to them. But Avram Avinu taught Torah to everyone that he came to. He made it his business that I am the ambassador of the Almighty. I am the salesman, the representative of Hashem in this world. I'm not going to keep it to myself. I'm going to go around and about. Vayikra b'shem Hashem. The biggest thing about Abraham is going around everywhere he goes. Vayikra b'shem Hashem. Vayikra b'shem Hashem. The goyim that he goes to, they say, Nisi Elohim ata betochenu. Your God's ambassador amongst us. That's how they related to Abraham. Because that, what, that is what he made himself to be. Right? The ambassador of Ribbon Right? Someone that cared about other people, not just about himself. You see, this makes all the difference between people. There are two categories of people in this world, if you want to generalize. There are people, which is the majority, vast majority, that they're concerned about me, the me generation, the big I, the capital I, and automatically, subconsciously almost, whatever you think is screened by this thought, what do I get out of this, right? When was the last time you did something for me, right? Everything is decided by the benefit and the profit that I'm going to draw out of this. <coughs> and then you have a tiny group of people who their greatness is their satisfaction from giving to other people, mm. from making the indelible mark into the creation, not by gathering, but by passing to other people. You see, people oftentimes have a, what they call a second mountain. You always set, when you mature, you set goals for yourself, right? And the more mature you are, the, the more crystal clear and defined the goals are. Almost 100% of people 
99.9 to be, to, to be more inaccurate, to be on the safe side, some point later in life, they will set a second mountain, second goal to reach for themselves. Some people in their 40s after mid, 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 midlife crisis, some people older ages when they have reached, semi-reached, or didn't reach the first one, doesn't make a difference, three subcategories to this. I'm not, that's not my topic right now to explain. But there's a second mountain to climb, which always, almost, is much more um, real and is oftentimes based on giving to others. Mm. Right? Bill Gates, what does he do now with his all his profit? Everything is going to tzedakah, basically now. Mm. You want to call it tzedakah, you don't want to call it tzedakah. Chesed, mim chatat, however you want to call it. But it's going towards higher causes. Avraham Avinu was the man that established this. Chesed Avraham. It was all about focusing on other people, outwardly, giving, giving, giving. And Hashem said, this guy is my ambassador. I make a breed with him. Mm. Yaakov could be much greater than him, but it's based on him. Mm. Everything that we have, our nation has, is based on Hesed of Abraham. Oh, to be outwardly, to, to establish a relationship that we are not just our own people, but rather, imagine to yourself, if you would walk, someone actually made a, a clip from this. <clears throat> it is walking around and it says on his shirt all over the place, it says God's ambassador. <sighs> and he's walking. And he has to be so much mindful to, to be nice and to be generous and to be gentle and to be this. <sighs> and then it shows that it says you are the same person whether you do or you don't have it saying on, on your shirt. We are, that's our, our mitzvah, we're the ambassadors of Hashem. Now, one person that perhaps more than anyone else took this seriously in the world of Torah was Chacham mm -hmm. He made it his business to care about other people. You see, he was addicted to learning. From the time that he was a little kid, mm -hmm. he, he had a ta'ava to learn. You know, you people have ta'ava, people have desire for a certain yetzerara. His ta'ava was to learn. Mm -hmm. he, he, he put him with the sefer. One of his uh, colleague's son, that the father was with Chacham uh, in primary school at the young age, asked him, he said, Abba, ech haya Chacham Ubadiyah katan? How was Chacham Ubadiyah when he was little? She so said, my father looked at me with like weird. He said, Chachabadiyah me'olam lo ayah katan. He said, Chachabadiyah was never katan. He was always learning. He was, uh, you squeezed him, he was learning. That's, that's what he was, <laughs> right? After school, he would go to Bet Knesset and learn until late night, his father had to come and grab him out of the, the thing. Right? <laughs> at age nine, already he was writing, eight, he was already writing Chidushe Torah. Right? He gave a Bechina and one set of Mishnayot and 60 Dapim of Masech of Baba Messiah. Bar Peh. Mila be mila, word for word. He was an unbelievable lover of Torah, aside from his genius and, and gifted memory that he had. He was, he was a lover of Torah. He was addicted to Torah. He was like, one of my friends would be David Ozeri Shlita. He was very close with the family. And he told me, he said, When he went once to, to visit the family, he went to the house, the, the, the Rabbi Tzor Margarit, the Rabbanit, took, um, took him in, gave him food and everything, so, so I want to go see the Rav. So, okay, Rav in Tzabim Misra, he's in the office learning. So I went to him, and I stood by his uh, desk, right over his, his thing, five inches away, for 25 minutes, in, he, he didn't realize it was there. Until, the Rabbanit, the wife, is passing by. He sees me standing still there. He says, David, don't you know? Haravi magimara kemo shikorim habakbuk. Right? You put my husband with the gimara, he's like a drunken with the bottle. He's not going to, you stand there for another two hours, he's not going to see you. Right? 
This was Chacham Obadiah. They have pictures you've pr- pr- perhaps seen. Rosh Hashanah is in his office with 20 other people, security personnel and, and photographers, many of them, and they're taking pictures with flash and with, with noise that he makes. For, for 20 minutes they're there. He's learning, writing. Kilu. At all, he didn't realize that they were there. This was Chacham Obadiah, right? But then there's a second part of Chacham Obadiah. That's like a part of Chaubadiyah. That he cared for other people. Every Elul. From his own thing, he would go to every single city in Eres Israel to talk to people. A month before the school start, even when he was much younger, he would go with his, you know, he, 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 was, a, he was a very poor person for most of his life, on behalf of his life. With his own personal money, he would go with buses to all the cities and he would knock on the doors. Imagine a person like this, his time is so important for him. Every minute is so important. <coughs> he would go knock on the doors and to convince people to send their kids to, to proper Jewish schools. Right? This was. Yeah, I want to tell you a story. He is 80 years old. Already he's the the most illustrious Talmud Chacham in the whole world. It's the busiest man. All the difficult questions go to him. I mean, all the difficult questions means all the difficult questions. Let me open apprentices for you. You know Rabbi Lau, the chief rabbi right now, the current chief rabbi. When he was much younger, he was Chavrutas with Rabbi Zamir Kohen. So I, I heard the story from Rabbi, Rabbi Zamir Kohen. He said, one day, Rabbi David Lau came to Yeshiva. He, was, he looked depressed. He said, what's with you? He said, my father-in-law just told me a story. Now his father-in-law was Rava'ir, Rava'ir al-Bag. And when you're Rav of a city, when you're Rav Rashi, whatever it is, you get all kinds of different questions, difficult questions, simple questions, compl- 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 complicated questions. And you're not, you know, it was a time of but you don't always have the answers to complicated things. So you send the questions to big people. But even big people, many times, if the question is very com- complex, they'll say, well, I have to work on it. I can't just make up an answer for you. I have to go look at the sources and work on it. In three days, I'll give you an answer. He said, you know, she's in the mikveh right now. Well, you're going to give me three days. Sometimes you need immediate answer. He says, there's one person that I call. He has the entire Torah in his brain on the spot. He'll always answer, right? And that's Chacham Badia. And this is what he says. He says, I call him. I present the complex question that no one wants to answer right now. And without batting the eyelash, he says, this is the halakha. You could be lenient, whatever it is. So he says, sometimes it's very surprising to me. He says, how can you be lenient in this? And I ask him, Chacham, do you mind if you tell, you tell me the sources? Where did you draw this from? I says, fine. And he starts. Boom, right there. Look at the Gemara in this and this page and this and this thing and this second side, fifth line. Look at the Tosafo, they ask this question, but then look at the other Masechta and that thing. And don't be surprised from the question that this asked it, because the other one asked. And it goes on and on. And he says, I can't write as fast as he says. I have to say, stop, Chacham, let me, let me finish writing, right? And everything with page and number and this. And says, afterwards, I will hang up, I will go check. And says, Me olam lo hayan. Didn't happen even once that he said it's on page 13 and it would be on page 14. Everything on the dot. Like, this is Chachobadiyah's value of time. Now he's 80 years old. A principal of Betsefer Torani comes to him. Now, you have to understand, Betsefer Torani doesn't mean a yeshiva school. In Eretz Israel, there are the non religious people, there are the religious people, the Haredi yeshiva men. And then there is a very large segment, they are traditional, they, they don't want their kids to hang out with the non-religious people who eat everything and do everything, but they're also not, uh, you know, they're not Haredi. So they go to Torah schools, the Tzefer Torah. So the principal comes to him and says, Arav, this family brought their child, their son, to my school. And he's a talented, wonderful, wonderful kid. And he started putting kippah on 
And the father was all frightened. He said, he was afraid, he said, you know, next thing you know, he's going to be a kitsoni, he's going to be this radical person. He's going to start keeping Shabbat and uh, tell me I can't do this, I can't, I, don't want, I, I want him to be like me. Took him out. So I, I sat, I spoke to him for two hours, nothing doing. He's set on his mind. So maybe you could give me a bracha. Maybe you could do something, give me a etzah. What do I do? So Chabadiyah tells him, he says, you have a car here? He says, yeah. He says, well, my driver is not here. Let's go with your car to his house. Right? He says, my car, I'm you. My car is like a rickety, dinky car. And I, it's not kavod for you to, to drive my car. He says, does it drive? He says, yeah, so it drives. Let's go. So he puts his, his green eyes. The show that's the only thing is he sniff it. He goes down the steps. The guy says, You mean it's business? He goes after it. He gets into the car. The guy gets in the car. He says, It was Yesurim. Every red light, the whole world is looking into my car. Hmm. Oh, but yes, in this car. And I'm shaking there by the, by the wheel. So we go 25 minutes to get to this house. It's on the top, top floor, fourth or fifth floor. 80, 85 year old man, step by step goes up. All the steps goes forth from. So I knock on the door. The guy comes out with, with, with shorts and undershirt. He says, Arabadi almost has a heart attack. He runs back in. He gets dressed properly. He comes in. He says, Aham, you came here for all the things. He says, It's nice. He says, You know, but it's good to this to have a son that's been Torah. And, you know, he says, sure, tomorrow he's coming back to school. No problem. <laughs> but he asks, who's going to say no, right? But the point is, for him, this was the most important thing in the world. All the difficult questions, all the things that he had to write and to give shiurim. Our drive back and forth, going up the steps to speak to get one kid in the issue. That, that was a round of you. Right? Yet people... By his levaya, a million people showed up. Almost. Because the biggest, the biggest levaya ever. No, people were stuck. And other, how many other people wanted to come? It was just closed. They couldn't come. But you see the footage of it. Like non from people, they're ripping their clothing, they're crying. They say, "This is our, this was our father," right? Because he cared. So Abraham was called Av Hamun Goim. As the father of all the nations, because he took responsibility for them. He took achrayut. He says, it's my responsibility to see to it that the whole world knows Hashem. And I can't do the whole world. I'll see how much I could accomplish until the day I could breathe, right? But that's a separate problem. I'm going to go around and about. I'm going to take responsibility for other people. Not just be to myself. And that's the good... You could say... From now until next week, you can see stories about him. So another time, he, this is a story he himself said three weeks before he passed away, less than a month before he passed away. He said about 40 years before that, one Shabbat, Rav Moshe Tzadkai came to him, to his house. He said he was pouring cats and dogs, pouring rain. Shlokum. And he comes in and says, Harav, this family has four kids, four sons, beautiful family, beautiful kids. They're smart, they're good. And the father just took, wants to take all of them out to public school. And the guy, you can't even find him. He's working hard. It's difficult for him. Parasad, is that? And only on Shabbat he's home. So Abadi says, let's go to his house. He's pouring. He puts his coat, he puts his hat. His wife, the Rabbanit, says, where are you going? He says, pikuach nefesh. He goes out. Right? They walk, I don't, I don't know how, how long they walk, because they come in drenched, dripping to this house. He sits, he talks to the father, talks to the father. And he was, when he talked, he heard that. And if you, um, he, the love that he had and emanated from him, it touched people's hearts. So after 20 minutes, the father says, okay, here's the deal. The three younger ones, they're going to stay in the Haredi school. The older one is already in Kitachet, he's in eighth grade. He's going to go to Tichon, he's going to go to, um, to the public school, to, to college, and I want him to become something. Rabbi tells him, look, I give you a bracha. 
אורך ימים במינה ובשמאלה, אושר וחמוד, הוא all become big and good, don't worry, he says no, this is the deal, fine, at least he saved three of them. So he comes out and three weeks before he passed away, he said, he said, this three kids, now one of them is Rav Shekhuna, Rav of all areas, one of them is, is Rosh Hashiva, and the other one is Rav Ha'ir, the Rav of the whole city, in Eretz Yisrael. And the fourth one is a Hashmelai. The fourth one is an electrician. He fixes electricity, goes here, goes there. Right? And that's the, the bracha that he gave, came. But again, the point of it is not what happened. The point of it is that he cared. These are like the regular stories that happened to him, by him, day in and day out. He cared for other people. He wouldn't go to a wedding, maybe, because he said, I have to write. But I write, is going to stay forever. It's like I have to, you know, prioritize. But when it was someone else's growth in Torah, that would become the top priority in his life. Right? And again, the Chuchmata Torah that he had was unbelievable. I want to tell you, one of the, I heard an interview with a non-religious person. Non-religious person. He was in politics, and once he was sent to speak with Harabadi about some uh, Shas-related issue. And he was speaking. He said, I come to his house, and they tell me he's in his study. And I go there, I look around, and I tell him, I say, how many Sfarim do you have here? There's, I don't remember the night, there's between 30 to 40,000 books there. And he tells me, he says, have you read all this? So Chabadia says, pick any of them that you want. Open it to a page, start a sentence, and I'll finish it. I wanted to understand this. So the guy says, I wanted to, ca to catch him. So I went on the, on the ladder to one of the top, top, Shelves are full of dust. You can see for years and years no one has touched, touched them. I pull out, I clean it, I blow it, I open, and I start in the middle of the page, one sentence, and the guy says that this is the human. man. He says he can't believe it. The man knew the book, the name of the book, the, the, the number of the page, and he started saying the page, mila be mila, word for word. Understand? This was Chacham Obadiah. Tried to find someone like that. And yet, he would come on Matzai Shabbat, he would talk to people, he would joke, everyone was on the floor. I don't know if you... I grew up in Iran listening to Chacham Right? That's how I learned Hebrew. I taught myself Hebrew listening to him. Right? In some way, you could say, uh, I'm a product of, of, of being very much impressed by, by his personality. He would sit there, regular people would come. They would joke with them and say, no, right? Brilliant, no, right? And he would laugh at them, he would enjoy himself. On the other hand, you open the Sifarim. It's unbelievable what he wrote at age 25, 26. You can't find it in, in the, nowhere. I've never, ever, ever seen the Sefer. That any is anything close to Yabi Omer, Sefer of Harvard. Right? It's an unbelievable talent. It's an unbelievable talent. Now, I want to sh share with you two stories that I heard from Rav Rashi, Rav Shlomo Amar. Right? He was after Harvard. Yeah, he became Drishon uh, Tzion, and he was one of the closest people to him. So he said that when he was much younger, Chaukadiyah once started, uh, wanted to start a chain of Sfardi Batedin in Eres Israel. Now, you have to understand, before Chaukadiyah, Sfardi were looked down upon. 
And again, with all due respect to Hashem Rosh Nazim, I'm not saying it has to be in a negative way, but that, that's why it was. It's not that the, the great Talmud HaChachamim of Dash Nazim were not like this, obviously, but in the Yeshivot, they, they even had names for Sfaradim. Like, you know, you call, some people call the African Americans names, and they had they had names. If a Sfaradi sat on a chair, it wouldn't be bizarre if other people would refrain from sitting there. One person changed this. One person, right? It was the, the genius of the, the, the genius of Chacham I haven't forgotten about the story I started, but I want to link it in with a different story. When he was 17 years old, he got connected very much with the Rabash in Yerushalayim, the Rav of Yerushalayim, the Ashkenazi Rav of Yerushalayim. He was Gaon Olam, he was an absolute genius. Tzvi Pesach Frank, Alava Shalom. And he, Haravadia, until the last breath of his life, he had a karatatu, he had a sense of gratitude, tremendous sense of gratitude towards Tzvi Pesach Frank, because he was one of the people who pushed him all the way up. And he, authoritatively, he was a big person. So how did they get connect? Tzvi Pesach Frank had a weekly um, get-together on Suda Shlishit every Shabbat afternoon. All of the geniuses from all the yeshivot of Yerushalayim would come there. And he would throw a question and they would all debate it and talk about it. And all of the, for those of you who you know, all the sfarim that he wrote called Mikra'i Kodesh are from those Shabbat afternoons. So Chavadia, I think was together with Chacham Bar- Baruch Ben Chaim, Alav they went, um, they went to this Chavadia, it was 16, 17, and he's sitting there. Rabbi Pesach Frank said, says something, and Harvard, yes, brings, starts, you know, other people, there were very fancy people, fancy-minded geniuses, so it's a logic like that, logic like that, twists, you know, it's very dinim to, to Allah. Harvard, you would know everything, said Tosfot in Menachot, this and this page talks about this, and based on the Tosfot in Bechorot, you could say this, everything in page, and, and Next week, same thing. After two, three weeks, Rabbi Pesach Frank said that this person is just not normal. And he started having him sit next to himself. And whenever Chacham Obadiah would come, now imagine the scene now. All of the greatest Talmidei Chachamim of Yerushalayim are sitting there. And this 17-year-old comes in, Sfaradi, dark, right? Rabbi Frank was the host who would stand up for me. Malaykum until he comes and sits. So one time, this bothered someone, one of the elders of, uh, of the people who were there, and he said, he stand up for this Frank, for this uh, Sephardi boy. And he turned to him and said, this Frank, which is like uh, the N-word, right? is going to be the biggest meshiv of the next generation. It's going to be the biggest tamihacham of the next generation. And this was Haramadi when he was 17. Right? So that when he was already Rav Arashi, he wanted to get together the Chachmeh Sfarad and make a bedin for the Sfaradim. So he got all of them together. And this is Rav Shlomo Amari saying this story. <laughs> So he says, he, he, he said to the people, Rav Shalom Amar is going to be involved with the Bedin of Mamunot, the Choshen Mishpat, and the, the monetary issues and so on. And this and this person, this, was telling people who. And then he says, and we're going to have a Bedin for Mikvaot. Mm-hmm. We're going to have a Bedin for issues of Mikveh. So everyone looks at him and says, Bedin for Mikvaot, who has heard of such a thing? Bedin for Mikvaot. You have someone who's in charge of Mikvaot and that's it. Arvadia tells him, says, no, 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 because if you say something that someone did wrong, let's say the, the mikveh lady did something wrong, and you know about it, or someone knows about it, and she denies it, it's called, it's a concept in halakha called ed echad behachashad. If you have two edim, two witnesses, nothing could stand in front of them. Two Adim are believed for everything. If you have one Ed, only one uh, testimony, right? Then 
there are many things that you listen to them and you may make the other person take a shvua or whatever else it is. But if you have one <coughs> testimony, one ed, you have one witness, and someone denies them, then it offsets each other. Ed echad behachasha. One witness with denial is not the one. So Arbadi says to them, says, therefore we want to have a bedin because you cannot deny a bedin, and therefore it's important to be a to have the authority to have a bedin. Okay, now, Rav Shlomo Amar told me, he said, he said, I knew of a tshuva, I knew of a information which I'm going to say in a minute, not like Harovadia. So I wanted to ask him. And he says, this information I have asked many Gedolei Israel, many Geonim, biggest of the they didn't even know that this Tshuva exists. What's that Tshuva? There's a response from the student of Noda Behuda. He wrote the Sefer called Tshuva Melahabai. So he had a story that happened to him. One day they call him, they say, Harav, the Shochet of the town wants to speak to you. He's dying and he has called you in. So he goes running. He goes in and says, sure enough, he's lying down, dying. Shkibra. He says, what? The shukhat starts crying. He says, Chacham, I want to tell you that I, unfortunately, have given terefot to people many times. <laughs> terefot? What? He says, look, I like to drink. And many times I'm tipsy, I'm over tipsy, I'm <laughs> drunk. And I am sure that many times my sakin, my knife, had pegam on it, had bumps in this, it wasn't the way it should be, and if that, that's the thing, it's never not. And it says, including the last shahidah I did yesterday. I'm sure that the sakin was totally messed up. So he pauses him, he runs outside, he makes a thing, says, Rabotai, whoever has any leftover from yesterday's shahidah, meet taref, the kenef tashlikhunoto, right? And you have to, to, to do hagala on all of your vessels. Fine, he comes back in. The guy cries, the Shubat, they say, we do it together, Shmai said, everything, fine. It is done, he goes, he goes home. But the, the Rav goes home. Whatever happened, maybe in the schut of the vidui and the, the confession that he did, he starts getting better, this Shochet. After three days, he recovers. After a week, he's ready to go to work. She so goes outside, people tell him, aren't you ashamed of yourself? He says, what, me? I'm ashamed of what? He says, you gave telephone to be with me. I'm Moshe Rabbeinu. What? I'm the best shohan that ever has existed under the, the, the sun. My sakin? There's no such a sakin in the whole world. <laughs> they tell him, Chacham, Haraf said that you, you... He says, Chacham? He goes to the Chacham, he goes to the Rav, he says, what you said? He says, what you said? To me, you went to the wrong address. To me, Sadiq Gamur. Sadiq Gamur. Shmuel Anavi wasn't as big as me. Right? So now, you have a problem. Now, what's the problem? You have Edecha. The Rav of town is the Ed. He's the, um, he's the testimony over here. And... His testimony is the witness. His testimony is denied by the guy himself. So many times the Chachamim in town said, well, halachically speaking, Edechad, Be'achasha, is worthless. So the Teshuvah Ma'avad, the Rav of town, sat and wrote a lengthy Teshuvah to disagree with that. He said, no, he cannot deny me. Why? Because there's a concept in Chosh and Mishpat that if, let's say, Aaron, you will come to me for a din Torah, and you say, I would say I'm not a bedin. Let's see if I'm not a bedin, right? You go to anyone, to Amaretz. He's not a Dayan, he doesn't know it. You say, I want you to be my Dayan. <clears throat> Even that the, that the guy is pasul for, for din Torah, you could accept him upon yourself as a Dayan. And then, whatever he says is binding for you. So he, he basically argues, he says, the Rav of town also has such authority because he has been appointed on all of the issues of town by people, nominated by people to do what he does. Therefore, he has the halakha of bedin. One person cannot deny him. That's what he writes. So Rav Shalom Amar, he knew this, 
teshuvah from teshuvah ma'ava. And when Harvadiya said he needed bedin, he wanted to ask him, how about this teshuvah? So he said, as soon as I started speaking, I said, Aval chacham yesh teshuvah, he wanted to say yesh teshuvah from it. So as soon as I started, Harvadiya looks at me and says, you mean the teshuvah in teshuvah ma'ava? And he gave him the page and the, the chapter and everything. He says, yeah, it's also brought in the Pitchet Shuvah, in this Siman, in this Sefer, in that Sefer, in that. All of them bring it. He says, but that's not the Halakha. And then he says, he goes on, off the cup, counting. He says, I, I, he, says, he says, I was trying to count. He says, at least 14 different sources that they disagree with the Shuvah Mahaba, each one of them with the name and the volume and the chapter and where, everything. He said, Ta'amili, he said, believe me, I almost dropped dead. I almost fainted. I couldn't believe it. And this is not something that he had, pre he had prepared. He just, I asked the question, and he just gave an answer. Right? Right? This was, you know, for those of who you know, the six volumes of his Sefer, Yechavidat, you know how they came about? He had a radio talk show that he participated in, and people would call in, it was live, and ask questions, and he would answer. And those questions and answers became this Sfari. And the answer was exactly like you see it in the Sefer, right? With all the sources and this and that. And one time, the person that was running the talk show, right, was, he was a guest, once a week, look up, the person said, he got so excited, he interrupted him, he, he said, I just want the listeners to know that Harav doesn't have any books here. He's saying all of this by heart. <laughs> you know, he, he couldn't believe it, right? He couldn't believe it. That's how it was, right? At the same time, he, and he was like this with, with everything. At the same time, he prepared everything that he, he gave a shi'ura. He was a responsible person. He came to our yeshiva before my time. But one of my friends that was there told me. Where, in Iran? No, in Baltimore. So he came, and the person is telling me the story. He says, I will never forget. He came into the Bet Midrash, and he says, What Masechet are you learning? He says, Kiddushin, or Baba Kama. And he says, What the af? This the I just go straight up to the to the podium. He says, I went to grab a Gemara and give him a place the Gemara. And as I bring the Gemara, he says, Lot Sarih, Lot Sarih, you don't need it. And he gave a Shi'ur, Aru Shishiba, both of them. He said they'd never heard a Shi'ur like this in their life. Both Rabbi Yaakov Moshe Kalevsky and Rabbi Yaakov Shmuel Yaakov Weinberg. Alei Mashalo. Right? This was the great, at the same time, he was so down to earth and emotional. He would learn Tanakh with his daughters, his kids, and Shabbat after Subhudah. And any time that he would become emotional, he would start crying. Can you imagine a man that knew everything, knew all the Tanakh, Pesukim, and, and so on and so forth. Right? And he knew them with chapter and verse. So you get to reading them to be emotional cry. Every year in the Bet Knesset, when you get to the story of Rashad Vaigash, the story of Yosef and his brothers, when he tells them and Yosef will cry. Right? You have a normal person, quote unquote, a genius, but as normal as you could get, as loving and caring as you could get. Right? And this was his greatness. There were people who said that Chaubadia just has a phenomenal memory. But uh, the depth of his understanding is, ah, come on. Right? In our yeshiva, after the first Rosh Yeshiva, it would be oxymoron if you, have, if you have memory. No, you, you have, you have people like that. You have that. Death, of uh, death of understanding. Not necessarily. You have people. Oh, the Gemara even talks about it. The Gemara in Horayot, the Gemara, the Gemara talks about, uh, page 13 of the Gemara, talks about Sinai and Oker Harim. You have these concepts that some people, they just grasp everything that they, they see and they learn. 
uh, photographic memory, and there are people who are ba'alis bara. They're such sharp minds, everything they could analyze and, and internalize, it's amazing. And the Gemara recognizes that you have some people who have only this, some people who have only that, right? And the Gemara says, which one of them is better? If I have a Tamil Chacham like that, and Tamil Chacham like that, which one is better? And that's what people said about Chacham Badiyat. It's not necessarily um, a, you know, a Lamdan. And I want to tell you a story, two stories about this. First, first and foremost, I want to tell you that this was the issue. The first Rosh Hashiva that we had was Rabbi uh, Yaakov Yitzchak Rudiman, Allah Shalom. He himself was a photographic memory. He was an unbelievable person. He's, he was known for his memory. Tremendous memory. Also like this, photographic memory. From age three already he was known in Europe uh, to be the rising star of the next generation. I could tell you story after story about him, but that's not our, our thing. So after him was supposed to become Rosh Hashiva Rab, 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 uh, Simcha Zizkiz Brod. Later on, he did not become our Rosh Hashiva, he became Rosh Hashiva in Hebron. But he was a tremendous, one of the top five, perhaps, Rosh Hashiva in the generation. And he was for a year in our Yeshiva giving classes, giving shiurim. And this is when Bar Ilan, project came out. But Ilan, they put all of the Svarim of the Jewish thing in a computer and you could search with a, with a wonderful search engine. And they wanted to run a um, Bar Ilan search together with asking Chacham Bar Ilan, see what happens, right? See who wins. And they did it. And Chacham Bar Ilan, he was faster and he had two sources that the computer didn't have. Mm. So he won, basically. Won the computer. So someone said this in the class with Rav Simcha Zisel, who he was, was giving the thing. And I said, yes, Chacham Badia won in Bekiyut, in, in knowing more sources. But the computer won in depth of understanding. Which is like a very, like, you know, very teasing, sarcastic thing. He got so upset. He said, You have to know that Chacham Obadia is Sar HaTorah. This is Ashkenazi talking about. He said, Chacham Obadia is Sar HaTorah. He's the general over the entirety of Torah. Don't you dare ever speak like this. But now I want to tell you a story about, um, and we'll, we'll try to end with this. I'll tell you a story about Rav Shlomo Zaman um, Orbach and Rav Shlomo Amar. So Rav Shlomo Amar, as I mentioned to you before, he is a Gaon. He was the next, uh, he was, you know, he was one of the following Rishon Etzions, right? He was, so he said he had, when he was younger, he had very long debates about the halachic concept called Nat Bar Nat, which Rav Shalom Mashash, right? What's Nat Bar Nat? Nat Bar Nat means Noten Ta'am Bar Noten Ta'am. If you have, let's say, a pot that you, by mistake, you made, made pork in it, right? And now it was washed well, okay? And then you, Cooked something in it. Is that thing mutar or asu? So the pork gave taste into the walls of this, 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 this pot, and now the walls went back and gave the taste into your rice. That's called mutantam bar mutantam. Is that mutar is that asu? That's the, the question. Or you have basar bechalav, right? Let's say you, you cooked the same case that we just said. You cooked basar, cholent, in in your pot, now you cleaned it well, and by mistake, now you cooked what in it? Macaroni and cheese. Macaroni and cheese, right? So now you have the taste of basar that went into, 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 the, into, into this pot, and now it came out and fused with this thing. Is it mutar? Is that so? It's a very long discussion, whatever. A lot could be written on it. So now, for those of you who know, the oh, Moroccans are very yeah. strong, <laughs> strong personalities, the Moroccans. The Rabbi Shalom Masas, he was the strongest they could get, 
right? If you wrote something against him, you could be sure that you would hear back from him until you backed up. It doesn't matter how many times. So Rav Shlomo Amar said, he said, I, when I was younger, I wrote a long tshuva against Rav Shalom Masas in this topic of Nath Barnath. And he wrote a long tshuva back to me, and I wrote even a longer tshuva back, and he wrote even a longer tshuva back, back and forth, five times back and forth. He said to the degree that between me and him, I thought there's nothing in the world that we haven't covered in this time. And someone even made a whole book on Nat Barnat from the Shuvot that they wrote back and forth together. Okay. So it says one, I'm, I'm making, it, making the long story short. It has other facets that I'm not saying. It, it's a fun story. To go through the whole thing is very fun. I'm, I'm shortening it. So it says one year, before Pesach, I said, well, a month before Pesach, I said, I have never worked on the topic of Nat Barnat on Pesach. All of, all of the things that I worked on Nat Barnat was on regular things for Basar Bachalav or for Isurim, for pork, whatever it is. But Pesach, Chametz and Pesach is a whole topic by itself because you know it's very strange. We hold that Nat Barnat of Chametz is Mutar on Pesach. Right? In other words, if Chametz gave taste to something and that thing they get gave to it, it's Mutar. On the other hand... Whatever the size, I thought it was like one six. Well, 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 that's the problem. Because we say on Pesach, Chametz is Asur Be'er Mashu. Even a thousand times more, it doesn't, doesn't nullify it. Yeah. Right? So I said, I wanted to work on this. So I said, for three weeks, I, I almost didn't eat any sleep. The entire three weeks I was working on this. Day and night. Working, working. This is, there's a Ramban. The Rahmanides, his commentary on, on, on Psachim, that I read it at least 15, 20 times. And not just read it, learned it 15 times. And it was a question on it, it wasn't clear, and I, I gave my own thing, I all built up of a beautiful, you know, fantastic masterpiece I made. I was so happy with it. Explained the, the Gemara and the concept and everything. And even before Pesach, I gave a class to the um, talented Avrechim, special Avrechim, and all of them loved it and loved me for it, and that's it. Good. So this is Erev Pesach every year. I would sell chametz for Yerushalayim, for the Bedina of Haravadia, me, Haravadia, and Rabbi Benjamin Levi. And since Haravadia always, after selling the chametz, it was Erev Pesach, the pressure was off, he was in a good mood. So after Mechirat Chametz, I asked him, Chacham, can I say something? So, sure, you take it. And he said, I, I started saying my whole chidush, but I said it in, like, in a very short, because, you know, you're speaking to someone that knows everything. You're not going to explain. So I said, Rashi Prakim, short. And I said it, and Rabbi Dibam said to me, he says, you're right. The Ramban says this. He said, I said, what Ramban says this? This is my chidush. He said, Lo He says, I wasn't successful to relay my chidush to him properly. He didn't get what I said. So he said, I mustered up some courage. And I asked him again, I said, Chacham, can I say it again? So he said, he smiled. I said, okay, go. So this time, he said, I explained it more. Right? I explained, explained, explained. And then, he says, correct. The Ramban says it. So this time, I, I felt horrible. I came out. I was like, okay. I wasn't successful to relay my message to Chaumbadi. They said Ramban says, Ramban doesn't say this. It's my Hidush. So I went to Pesach, I'm busy. You go, Seder night. Tomorrow, I told myself, wait a second. He told me twice the Ramban says this. It must be something. That night, so I took the Ramban. I started reading it over and over and over and over again. The Ramban that he had worked on for, for three weeks, he read it 20 times. I said at the end, it dawned on me how the Ramban, Ramban is a very cryptic sefer. It's the most difficult of the, the medieval authorities of Al-Khat to read. He was such a gaon that he wrote almost like in codes. You have to be accustomed to learn Ramban to understand fully the depth of what he says. I says at the end I realized Ramban says every single thing that I thought I was saying, the whole magnificent build up that I made, it was in the words of the Ramban. He said, ah, the difference is, I learned it 20 times, and I didn't see it. 
Chacham Obadiah, yeah, I read it once, he knew what he was talking about. He said, I, I became depressed for a month afterwards, I couldn't learn. I said, then why are we wasting time? What were we doing already? Okay. I said, he said, after a month, I said, okay, so I can't just waste my life and learn, fine. Like, you know, what was bad or nothing. But this is the depth of Chacham Obadiah. Yeah. What right. rabbis do for a month when they don't learn? <laughs> what? No, it was Shavur. It was Shavur. See, you, should, you have to understand, Chacham Obadiah had a period of, of his life. Chacham Obadiah had a period of his life. He was depressed too. What happened to him? Before his time, when you became the Rishon Zion, it was a job for life. Until you resigned or until you were just not functional. Chacham Obadiah became Rishon Zion. He was using every single cent that he could get from the, the government and every single minute and second that he had to spread Torah. He had a private helicopter in Elul. Every single town, small area, very successful, he would speak. Would take too much time with, with, with car, he would go with helicopter. From place to place to place to place to place to speak. And he, from his own money, he would support, he made schools, he made a whole chain of schools called El Ayan. So the Israeli government is a and this guy is dangerous. Right? You leave him another 10 years, he's going to turn them up. Everyone's going to become from, they're going to change the government. So they changed the law. For the first time in history, they said Rishon Letzion only 10 years. Right? And that's it. They took him down. And he was broken. Because he, he, for someone that was close with him, he said, I, I heard him, he said that year, he couldn't talk, he was depressed. When he couldn't give to other people, when he couldn't teach, he couldn't live. And that's when, actually, the idea of a political um, shas, shas came, came about. And he became even much bigger than what he was before. It was a cheshbon of Hashem. But that's, see, a person that his heart beat was for the Torah. His heartbeat was for the Torah and for making schools. Five years ago, for the first time in the history, we had more Talmidei HaYeshiva Sfaradim than Ashkenazim in Eretz Israel. Wow. That's all because of him. Right? Mesirut Nefesh that he did for the Torah. So, it is your side that Chazal say, it's based on the Gemara. Tonight? Is there a... No, three days ago. Based on a, a Gemara in Brachot, on page 6 in the Gemara in 17, when a person passes away, all of his kohot nefesh, all of the energy that he had, is there up, up for grabs. You could be zochet, you could gain from that energy. And I think it's safe to say that if you would be here tonight, you would ask us to become like that, to spread Torah, to learn Torah, first and foremost, and to spread Torah, to make sure our kids go to Yeshivot, not just Jewish school. Yeshivot, that they're going to come out. You have to ask yourself one thing. When my kid graduates, can he learn Gemara like that Mit Chacham? I say yes. Right? So that's, that's, that, would be, that would be the thing. That's what he would want from us, to, to be able to value Torah the way he valued it. When he came with his wife the second time to our yeshiva, his wife told the wife of my Rosh Yeshiva the following. He said, this is how they live, with nine children. They were in one bedroom. And she said, my husband was in giving Telazza. classes. In one bedroom. In Telazza. Right? And he said, my husband was giving classes to his Talmudim in the school. I had to nurse my child under the table where he was sitting with the students. There was no other place that was modest. That's how they lived. Didn't have enough money, he would go learn by the the, the, the light pole in the street. One one of the Gedulei Yerushalayim, he testified, he said, I would come, many times he happened, he said, I would come 12 o'clock midnight from the Beit Midrash to go home and sleep. How much can you stay up? And Chacham Badia is standing by the leaning of the light pole, learning a sefer. I would go sleep, get up in the morning, go back to Bet Midrash for davening with Netzach Hama, he was still there. Not once, not twice, this is, that was him, right? 
the misirut nefesh, the sacrifice that he did for the Torah. It's something for us, you know. Something for, he, he once went up the ladder, he once went up the ladder to get the sefer, to look in, until the ceiling he was for him. He goes up there, he takes something, starts reading it. So he forgets, he's on the ladder. When he's done, he puts it back, starts walking, he falls, he breaks his leg. <laughs> Allah wa shalom, his mind was in the Torah. His mind was, you know, that's what he was. And his chut is there for us, you know. If we grab it, as the energy is there, we have to focus more on learning Torah, spreading Torah, Bezrat Hashem, the, the education of Torah to our kids. And with that chut, Bezrat Hashem, we're going to be zochet. So, to see him, Amen. Amen. Amen.